Live stream okay, so, is rolling. Sergeant, please start your recordings. Recording to PC underway. Recording to the cloud, all set. Good morning, and welcome to the remote hearing on government to operations. Will council members and staff please turn on their video at this time? Thank you. To minimize disruptions, please place all cell phones, electronics to vibrate. To send testimony, please send it to testimony at council.nyc.gov. Once again, that's testimony at council.nyc.gov. Chair, we are ready to begin. Good morning, I'm Council Member Sandra Ong, Chair of the Committee on Governmental Operations. I'm thrilled to be here today at our committee's first hearing on the new session. I would like to welcome my colleagues who joined us, Council Member Yeager and Brewer. At today's hearing, the committee will be conducting oversight on New York City's pro-voter law. This law requires over 25 city agencies to offer voter registration to eligible New Yorkers when they apply for city services. First enacted by the city council in the year 2000, the law, pro-voters law, was designed to supplement state and federal laws that rely heavily on DMV offices to register voters. Enlisting DMVs in voter registration efforts makes sense in much of the country, given the high rate of car ownership nationwide. In New York City, however, residents are much less likely to own a car and are therefore less likely to visit their local DMV. The provost laws is intended to reach those New Yorkers who may never visit DMV office, but who interact with the government other ways. In a state like New York, where registering to vote remains a burden, the pro-voter law can make it easier for New Yorkers to get themselves registered and keep their registration up to date. In addition, by listing city agencies, many of which target low-income households and disproportionately reach communities of color, the pro-voter law can address racial economic disparities in voter registration rates. Today's hearing is an opportunity to ensure that the pro-voter law is living up to its promise. We will hear from Democracy NYC and the Campaign Finance Board regarding how agencies are implementing the law. In addition, the committee will explore ways in which the law can be updated and improved, particularly in light of forthcoming reforms at the state and local level. From online registration to municipal voting, the landscape of democracy will look very different than it did 22 years ago when pro voter law was first enacted. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> I look forward to discussing these and other changes for our panelists. And with that, I would like to thank representatives from Democracy NYC, Campaign Finance Board, who have come to testify today. I also want to thank Julia Fredenberg, Sebastian Batchi, and CJ Murray from Essential Staff for putting their work into this hearing today. Finally, I'd like to thank my own Chief of Staff, Alexander Hart, for assistance. I would now like to turn to our moderator, Committee Council CJ Murray, to go over some of the procedural items. Thank you, Chair Ong. I'm CJ Murray, Counsel to the Committee on Governmental Operations. Today's hearing will begin with a panel of representatives from the City's Democracy NYC Initiative and the New York City Campaign Finance Board. From Democracy NYC, Chief Democracy Officer Laura Wood will be providing testimony. And from the Campaign Finance Board, testimony will be provided by Assistant Executive Director for Public Affairs, Eric Friedman, and Deputy Director of Public Affairs, Amanda Melillo. After the panelists provide their testimony, there will be time for council member questions. If council members would like to ask a question of our panelists, please use the Zoom raise hand function, and I will call on you in order. We'll be limiting council member questions to five minutes, which includes the time it takes the panelists to answer your question. Please note that for ease of this virtual hearing, there will not be a second round of questioning outside of questions from the committee chair. After council members have asked questions of the first panel, members of the public who have signed up to testify today will be invited to speak. Each member of the public will be given three minutes to provide their testimony. To all hearing participants, please note that you will be on mute until you are called on to testify, at which point you will be unmuted by a member of our staff. As a reminder, all hearing participants may submit written testimony to testimony at council .nyc.gov. We'll now hear from our first panel. Before we begin, I will administer the oath. Chief Democracy Officer Wood, Assistant Executive Director Friedman, 
and Deputy Director Malillo, please raise your right hand. I will read the oath once and then call on each of you individually for a response. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee? And to respond honestly to council member questions. Chief Democracy Officer Wood. I do. Assistant Executive Director Friedman. Yes, I do. Deputy Director Malilla. I do. Thank you, Chief Democracy Officer Wood. You may begin your testimony. Thank you, Chair Ung and members of the Committee on Governmental Operations and of course the staff for holding this hearing and for the opportunity to submit testimony on the important question of New York City's pro-voter law. My name is Laura Wood and I am the Chief Democracy Officer at Democracy NYC or DNYC. DNYC was created in 2018 as a mayoral initiative and pursuant to an executive order signed at the end of last year, it is now a program of the New York City Civic Engagement Commission, CEC. Since its creation, DNYC has closely collaborated with the CEC on multilingual resources, communication strategy, and in-person and virtual events and workshops. This merger will further streamline these efforts and ensure that we have maximum impact through closer coordination. DNYC's mission is to increase voter access, foster civic engagement, and promote voter turnout for all New York City residents. Our work is focused on direct outreach, developing communication strategies and educational materials, and advocating for legislation and policy changes to make voting more accessible to New York City residents. Pursuant to Local Law 29 of 2000, the city's pro-voter law, participating agencies submit their semi-annual compliance reports to the Mayor's Office of Operations, which compiles them into a single report that is sent to the council speaker twice annually. Although Local Law 29 predates DNYC and the CEC, and neither have a formal role contemplated in the law, since its inception, DNYC has prioritized interagency collaboration as a top strategy to ensure that city voter engagement efforts are coordinated and that we are reaching as many New Yorkers as possible. This testimony is offered to highlight examples of the interagency collaboration that has supported voter registration and voter engagement work in recent years. Among other things, DNYC has partnered with the Department of Education, DOE, and the Mayor's Public Engagement Unit, PEU, on Civics Week and the annual Student Voter Registration Drive. We partnered with the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs, MOYA, to provide language assistance at poll sites and ensure that materials about voting, including voter registration forms, are translated and accessible to limited English proficient New Yorkers. We worked with the Mayor's Office for People with Disabilities and our close colleagues who are here today at the New York City Campaign Finance Board to, um, to ensure that voter guides are available in American Sign Language. These are just a few examples of the collaborative pro-voter interagency work that we have prioritized in the past few years. As I mentioned, for the past several years, DNYC and PEU have partnered with the DOE on an annual student voter registration drive as part of DOE's Civics Week and Civics for All initiative. These collaborative efforts, which have also involved volunteers from several other city agencies, have led to the pre-registration and registration of approximately 60,000 high school students, with nearly 30,000 students registering in the March 2020 drive, the week before the city went into the COVID-19 lockdown. I'm pleased to announce that the 2022 drive is just a few weeks away and we are thrilled to be able to be back in classrooms in every borough of the city. In 2018, DNYC and PEU registered over 600 new voters at the Rikers Visitor Center and trained law librarians at Rikers to help incarcerated persons at the jail register to vote and request absentee ballots. And our collaboration with DOC continues to this day. In 2020, following uh, the start of the pandemic and the stalling of the implementation of online voter registration, 
we contracted with the nonprofit Democracy Works to create a virtual registration tool called TurboVote, which we shared widely with city agency and external partners to make the process of voter registration during the pandemic easier. In partnership with the CEC and PEU last year, we created a voter, voter registration social media toolkit and a public service announcement on voter registration, which were both distributed widely to city agencies and external partners. DNYC and PEU's outreach efforts have yielded extremely high contact with New York City voters. In the past three years, we directly reached 4 million voters via text or phone. And despite the pandemic and the fact that we still do not have universal online voter registration in New York, we actually saw a net increase in voter registration in the city with about 600,000 more voters on the rolls since 2018. In addition to the collaborative voter registration work, DNYC and agency partners have prioritized increasing voter turnout and engagement an extremely important task given the city's persistently low voter turnout numbers. In 2020, right after the city went into lockdown at the start of the pandemic, DNYC and the CFB began regularly convening government agencies and external partners. This so-called NYC Elections Consortium continues to bring together 40 plus good government groups, CBOs, city agencies and elected officials offices to regularly discuss and address issues related to NYC elections, share outreach and other events, coordinate social media campaigns, and advocate for policies to ensure that elections are accessible to all New York City voters. Thanks to our strong interagency partnerships and collaboration, we also, throughout the pandemic, consulted with the city's Department of Health and Mental Hygiene to ensure that messaging and policy around voting safely during COVID-19 was accurate and up to date. Heading into the 2020 general election, DNYC launched the first ever NYC Election Observer Corps, a 500 plus volunteer voter protection effort. These volunteers, many of whom were city employees volunteering their time on a paid holiday, monitored election day poll sites for instances of voter intimidation and directed voters to nonpartisan resources in the five Voting Rights Act languages. This work was made possible through our volunteers and our agency partners, including PEU, CEC, NYC Service, MOYA, CAU, the 2020 NYC Census Team, and the Mayor's Office of Operations. As the committee is well aware, the June 2021 primary was nothing short of historic, with over 350 candidates on the ballot in competitive municipal elections across the city, and the first ever citywide election with ranked choice voting. Democracy NYC, along with key partners at the CFB, the NYC Board of Elections, CEC, MOYA, the Young Men's Initiative, DOHMH, and PEU hit the ground running to ensure voters were provided with information about RCV and the importance of the June primary in the neighborhoods they lived and in the languages they spoke. This work was bolstered by an unprecedented investment of 15 million to educate New Yorkers about RCV and included a citywide advertising campaign in 25 languages, direct partnerships with community groups, faith-based organizations, minority and women-owned businesses, and other stakeholders. All told, DNYC worked with over 155 partners, held over 50 workshops in over five languages, sent over 2.4 million text messages, and made 9,000 phone calls to inform New Yorkers about RCV and their voting rights. We sent over a million robocalls, mobilized nearly 400 volunteers, and engaged over 5,000 people at in-person events. In addition, we and our partners created 36 video public service announcements and offered printed multilingual materials to any agency, external organization, or elected official who wanted it. 
over 300,000 pieces of literature in 20 languages were distributed to over 150 organizations and offices citywide. The results of these interagency efforts were clear. We saw New York participation in a mayoral primary surge to the highest rate in 30 years. Although participation is not where it should be, DNYC is hopeful that continued interagency coordination and collaboration can increase both voter registration and turnout in the years to come. We look forward to working with existing and new partners to continue to support voter registration and participation. And we are also looking ahead to the implementation early next year of the NYC Municipal Voting Program. And along with Moya and other agency partners, we'll work to support BOE and CFB in this effort. Now, language access is an integral part of civic inclusion in New York City, where 49% of New Yorkers speak a language other than English at home, and 23% are limited English proficient. One of the Civic Engagement Commission's mandates under the city charter is to expand access to language interpreters at poll sites throughout the city for LEP voters, which is part of CEC's larger commitment and mission to increasing support available to LEP New Yorkers in the CEC's programs and services. To further meaningful access to the electoral process, the CEC has expanded poll site language assistance for LEP New Yorkers and worked to increase awareness of poll site interpretation rights. The CEC established a language assistance advisory committee to provide recommendations for the further development and implementation of the program. The program, which is governed by a statutorily mandated methodology in the city charter, has provided interpretation services in the following languages. Arabic, Bengali, Chinese, both simplified Cantonese and Mandarin, French, Haitian Creole, Italian, Korean, Polish, Russian, Urdu, and Yiddish. Since the program's inception in November 2020, CEC has served over 2,700 people in 11 languages. The CEC would be delighted to further brief the committee on this program. Both DNYC and the CEC as a whole are committed to ensuring that all New York City voters have access to our democratic process, particularly during a time when our democracy is under direct threat. And we are thrilled to have such wonderful agency partners who are equally committed to this work. We look forward to further discussion on improving voting and other ways we can work together with the council, city agencies, and other stakeholders. Thank you again to Chair Ung and the committee members for your time today. Thank you. I'd now like to welcome the Campaign Finance Board to give their testimony. Good morning. Uh, thank you to uh, Chair Ong and, and to the members of the New York City Council Committee on Governmental Operations for the opportunity to testify today about agency-based agency -based voter registration, also known as Local Law 29 or LL 29. My name is Eric Friedman. I am the Assistant Executive Director for Public Affairs at the New York City Campaign Finance Board. With me today is Amanda Molo, Deputy Director for Public Affairs. Uh, and we're both really pleased to be able to join you for the first hearing of this new council term. And we, we very much look forward to, to working with this committee throughout the session. Uh, we're gonna start off with a quick overview of the CFB's role in, in helping to support the administration of Local Law 29. Um, we'll talk a little bit about how recent changes to voting laws have impacted the way that, that Local Law 29 is administered and, and finish up with a few recommendations on how to improve the law. Uh, but first, agency-based voter registration provides all eligible New Yorkers with the opportunity to register to vote while receiving critical services from city agencies. The work of these city agencies, along with programs specifically devoted to voter education, like the CFB's NYC Votes Initiative, in concert with the passage of major pro-voter laws at the state and federal level, have resulted in a 91% rate of registration for eligible New Yorkers. The CFB, with the advice of our Voter Assistance Advisory Committee, provides best practices guidance on the voter registration process 
to identify city agency voter coordinators as required in the law. Annual trainings for voter coordinators are conducted by CFB staff. As of last year, they've also incorporated explanations of ranked choice voting as required by Local Law 21 of 2021. Last year, the CFB conducted seven trainings directed to city agency staff ahead of the primary election and two additional trainings in partnership with the mayor's office before the general election. Representatives from all the covered LL29 agencies were in attendance at these, at these trainings. CFB staff emailed the agency voter coordinators in advance of key voter registration dates with suggested social media language and graphics suitable for posting on agency websites. Additionally, beyond what is specifically defined in the law, we provide periodic email updates about other election related dates, such as the deadline to request an absentee ballot, the start of early voting, and election day itself. We also work with Department of Correction staff to establish guidance for justice involved individuals and periodically review the voting rights pamphlet they distribute at intake and release from custody. This year, we've also joined DOC's Voting Rights on Rikers Island Working Group and look forward to assisting them in delivering voter registration and absentee ballot information to New Yorkers in DOC facilities. Other LL29 agencies go above and beyond the scope of the law to provide much needed voter and civics education to youth and students with programming assistance from the CFB's Youth Voter Coordinator and Partnerships Team such as the Department of Youth and Community Development, the Administration for Children's Services, and the Department of Education. LL29 was intended to build on previously existing federal and state laws that required government agencies to support voter registration. Currently, the State Department of Motor Vehicles maintains an online voter registration system that requires a state ID card. However, this leaves out about 10% of city res residents over the age of 16 without such an ID and cannot access the system. LL29 helps fill these gaps. Any eligible city resident, regardless of whether they have a state ID, can register to vote on a paper form at the time they interact with any local Law 29 agency. As mentioned in recent Mayor's Office of Operations reports, there's been a decline in the number of LL29 registration forms during the COVID-19 pandemic. This is consistent with lower re voter registration rates overall during COVID, likely caused by the lack of in-person interactions and fewer in-person voter registration events. However, according to City Board of Elections annual reports between the years 2010 and 2020, agency-based voter registration forms at their peak only made up about 6% of total voter registrations in the city. Several recent pro-voter laws will significantly impact agency-based voter registration. Rollout of state reforms in 2023, including automatic voter registration and online voter registration will naturally reduce the reliance on paper voter registration forms, including those offered by LL29 agencies. AVR will automatically register New Yorkers who interact with state agencies, and a fully accessible online portal will allow all city residents to register online. LL29 agencies may consider shifting their processes to confirm the status of a voter's registration and assist voters in filling out the OVR website forms if necessary. The state's online portal will likely only provide support in five languages. Therefore, Paper forms will still be vital for limited English proficient communities who speak the designated citywide languages. In early 2021, the state also restored the right to vote to New Yorkers on parole, who previously required a conditional pardon by the governor to vote. Restoration of voting rights to individuals on parole provides greater opportunities for Department of Probation and Department of Corrections to register more city residents who leave their custody. Overall, these changes to state law make the registration process vastly simpler for voters and reduce the administrative burdens for agencies. Lastly, the City Council recently expanded municipal voting rights to 825,000 city residents authorized to work in the United States, 
starting in 2023, this group of voters will have their own registration form and registration processes with the City Board of Elections that will not be connected to the system supported by the state BOE, such as OVR. However, they will be likely to seek city services at the same rate, or possibly a higher rate, than those who are currently eligible to vote and are a huge audience for future agency-based voter registration efforts. With these major voting changes on the horizon, there's a need to think critically about which city residents are served by agency-based voter registration. There are several important opportunities to expand the scope of the law and to modernize the way voter registration is incorporated into existing LL29 agency processes. One potential area of improvement is to expand the distribution of paper re voter registration forms in additional languages. The city BOE currently provides city agencies with voter registration forms in English, Spanish, Chinese, Korean, and Bengali. In 2016, in partnership with the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs, the CFB translated the standard voter registration form into 11 additional languages, including those covered by the designated citywide languages law. However, there is not currently a routine process for city agencies to request these forms, nor for the CFB to distribute them. There's also an opportunity to standardize the service delivery of paper of paper voter registration forms for city only voters. The CFB plans to work with the city BOE to translate city only voter registration forms into the same additional languages offered for standard voter registration forms. The named local law 29 agencies should also be required to register this new group of city only voters. As mentioned earlier in, in our testimony, the voter registration rate in New York City is actually quite high at 91%. However, our turnout rate for elections is routinely lower than New York State overall, which regularly ranks in the bottom half of turnout compared with other states. A final potential area of improvement is to require LL29 agencies to promote and publicize voting information provided by the CFB to ensure consistent messaging from a single reliable source. This could include information the CFB already supplies, such as election date reminders and best practices for absentee ballots. For example, agencies serving populations who are more likely to request an absentee ballot, such as the Department of the Aging or Department of Corrections, could be required to assist voters in the process of submitting an absentee ballot request form. With more and more residents engaging with government agencies virtually, the law could also be modernized to require consistent posting on city agency websites and social media. The current law does not require dissemination of election materials, elections information, such as election day reminders, though the CFB does include LL29 agency voter coordinators in our email outreach. The law also doesn't require monitoring the distribution of voter information by city subcontractors who are the frontline service providers of some of these agencies. While these areas of improvement are specific to the city's agency-based voter registration law, there are also crucial legislative and policy changes that can only be made at the state level, which we routinely advocate for in the CFB's annual voter analysis report and in testimony before the state legislature. We're grateful for the opportunity today to provide testimony on this important city law and how we believe it can be improved to register all eligible New Yorkers. And we are happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. I'll now turn it over to Chair um, for any questions. Thank you. Well, first I want to um, welcome and thank um, Council Member Ressler and Shulman for joining the hearing today. Um, thank you both for the testimony. I do have a couple of questions. Uh, the poll voter law contemplates three ways which a person might apply for city services. It's in person, through the mail online. Do we know what's the most common way right now uh, for a person to apply for city services today? Hi, Chair Ung. Um, I, I, don't, I don't actually know 
definitively which is the most common, although we have heard anecdotally in talking with agencies that more and more movement is, is going online as far as applying for city services. Um, perhaps the CFB knows more definitively, but we're happy to, to do a more complete survey and, and get back to you. Thank you. I think we would defer to the to our colleagues from the mayor's office to talk about, um, you know, kind of talk generally about the way that city, that uh, New Yorkers interact with city agencies. But um, you know, I think we kind of generally share the observation that more and more of of this activity is is, is happening online. Okay, thank you. But, okay, so right now because of COVID, do we know how many um, pro voter law agencies are remain closed to in person visitors? Uh, my, my understanding is that is that all offices have reopened. Uh, I think there were some temporary closures depending on the agency, although many of them continued providing in person service throughout the pandemic. Um, as as um, Eric noted, there, there has been a bit of a drop off just because I think there's been less demand for in person service and therefore fewer voter registrations, voter registration forms being transmitted. But um, but my understanding is that as of today, all offices are open. That's great, thank you. Um, and I think the law just requires agency provide individuals with assistance in completing the voter registration form. Do we know how that works in a very practical way? If someone walks into a city agency and they you know they are like like you know they're filling out the voter registration forms, how does that practically you know? work, if you could walk us through the process. Well, I, I can share what agencies have provided, what information agencies have provided, and then um, perhaps my colleagues from the CFB want to speak to the training more specifically. Um, but, but my understanding is that when individuals come in to, to an agency to apply for service or, you know, to interact about whatever their particular issue, they are offered voter registration materials. And then if needed, they're offered assistance in actually filling out those paper forms. Um, most agencies also have available to them the translated voter registration forms. Um, those are available in the Voting Rights Act languages on the city BOE's website. And then thanks to a partnership between the CFB and the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs, they are available in a number of other languages online. And I believe that at least some agencies provide those more extensive translations to their clients. So what, what I would add is, and I spoke a little bit in our testimony about our trainings, um, the trainings we provide to covered agencies. Um, so our trainings in 2021, um, we had 36 representatives from across those agencies who we trained. Um, these are train the trainer sessions. Um, and, and I'll ask Amanda to kind of jump in and provide a little bit more detail on what those look like. But, but the idea is we're giving the voter coordinators in each agency the tools to share knowledge with, uh, with folks on the front lines in each agency and help them answer questions. Um, and, and guide New Yorkers through the process of registry. So just following up with that, if, if a person either on the phone or in person doesn't ask about any part of that voter registration portion of the form, then I guess that, that question that it's, it doesn't get done, you know, like, so would there have to be an active part on the person seeking help to want to get, to want to be, to want to get registered to vote? Yeah, I would love to jump in and answer, address that question and also add on to what Eric said before, because one of the things that our staff did prior to the pandemic, but has candidly happened less during the pandemic, is we would meet with the voter coordinators at the local law 29 agencies and go in person to sort of assess how our service is delivered to the public. What do those interactions look like between the agency and its customers? And where are areas where we can more seamlessly integrate voter registration? I think the agencies that do this the best or, or that did prior to the pandemic 
um, really thought about how is it that we interact with our customers? Does it happen in person? Um, how can we be proactive about making sure people are aware voter registration opportunities are available? Where can we put signage in places that people are going to see it? Because this is the case with LL29 and, and our pro voter law. In the same way it's true of motor voter, for a long, long time, agencies were considered to be meeting the standards of the law as long as a stack of voter registration forms was available to people. Um, you know, one thing to consider is um, sort of like working that into an agency's frontline operations more seamlessly. I know some agencies are more proactive about this than others and asking people, are you registered to vote or can we help you at this time? Um, so that that is one thing I would say, because I think you're right. In a lot of cases, voters would have to know to actually ask for voter registration assistance, especially in the instances where they aren't going to offices in person anymore when they're doing things online or via the phone. Um, so they're not going to get like that visual reminder that this is something maybe that they could um, also do at that government agency. No, thank you. I think that's a great follow up. We would definitely like to um, explore a little further about the agencies that does well and being a little bit more proactive on engaging with the people seeking help. So thank you. Um, so I was looking at the performance data, on the open data portal, and only 1% of the voter registration form that were distributed by city agencies since 2015 were actually collected by those agencies and sent to BOE. So 1% is low. <laughs> so is there any ideas of why it is, it is 1%? Laura, I don't know if you'd like to address this. I have ideas, but not definitive answers. <laughs> why don't you go ahead and then I'll chime in if I have anything to add. Yeah, I would say there are a couple reasons. Um, this is actually very similar to what we find when we're registering people in person at voter registration drives. We have found a best practice is to make sure that people complete the forms while they're standing there with you um, so that you can sort of check them and make sure that everything's filled out correctly. Um, what tends to be a lot of uh, impulses of people who are going to fill out a form to register to vote is, oh, I'll just take the form with me. And you know, I'll fill it out later when I get home. And then it tends to go in that person's later pile. So I think there is like a bit of a gap between the forms that the Board of Elections is actually getting to agencies, the forms that agencies are handing out, and then the number of forms that they're collecting back. Um, just because that process can be a little bit leaky in terms of people taking the form with them. Another thing um, that we've been thinking about as, uh, as we start to transition to more, ha uh, more registrations happening online and more registrations happening through state agencies as we start to switch over uh, to automatic voter registration and online voter registration sometime in 2023 is that this makes that sort of data collection even more challenging. Um, you know, one thing that Laura mentioned in her testimony is that they have a turbo vote platform. Uh, NYC Votes also has a turbo vote platform. And I will tell you, like, neither of those platforms is actually coded uh, with code nine the way agency forms are. So even if agencies are like giving out that link for people to use, unless we're tagging it on the back end to track where those registrations are coming from, those won't necessarily get reported as code nine registrations. Thanks. I, I think that's all absolutely correct. And, and the one thing I would add is that, you know, if, if we are looking towards other ways to encourage New Yorkers to register, I mean, certainly providing those online registration tools as they become available next year, I think will be invaluable to agencies. Um, continuing to expand the languages that are you know, that these materials are translated into, I think will also make them much more accessible. And, and I also think that really doubling down or tripling down on relationships with external organizations is really critical um, because I think, you know, 
to, you know, that later pile <laughs> that Amanda mentioned is a real thing. But if there's a trusted community member who is making the pitch to register to vote, I think that has a different impact. So certainly there is a place for agency based registration, and I think it, it can continue to strengthen and improve. But we do have to kind of look outside the box if we really want to, to increase that number. Oh, that's great. We'd love to work together on that. Um, actually, since we are Turbo Vote, how many languages are available in Turbo Vote? I have yet to get on this, I get on this platform myself. <laughs> <clears throat> Sorry, having Amanda. some issues with the with the unmute. Go ahead, Eric. No, no I, I was gonna I was gonna ask Amanda to jump in and, and, and kind of talk about the the platform that, that we stood up through NYC Vote. Yeah, I was waiting for Laura, and then I'm happy to address that just as we look ahead to uh, municipal voting. So I, I believe that the Turbo Vote platform is is only available in English at the moment. That is something that we're looking at expanding. Um, however, both the mayor's office of immigrant affairs, um, as well as other city agencies have offered to provide language assistance to people who want to register either using that portal or, or any of the other available mechanisms. Um, so, so that's basically the option at the moment. Um, but we are certainly with, with the appropriate resources would be, would be very interested in expanding that further. Great. Yeah. Uh, oh, I'd just love to jump in because I, I think Turbo Vote may be available in English and Spanish, but one of the things we've been talking about internally in a very preliminary way um, is looking ahead and do we want to work with Democracy Works potentially to design solutions once we know there are going to be municipal only voter registration forms available, um, because that's not something that Turbo Vote has designed before. But we're thinking a lot about that user experience. And one of the things that we would look to do as part of that is add more translations. Uh, you know, the CFB to date has only provided translations in the Voting Rights Act languages. And now we're adding two more Voting Rights Act languages plus six citywide languages we hadn't covered before. So I think this would be a major priority for us as we look to any online solutions, especially because, I mean, we have some concerns um, just about the state platform, because the state platform will only be in Voting Rights Act covered languages. So a, no a number of languages that we're going to be co covering for citywide languages will not be covered at the state level unless state legislation passes this session. So we're really looking at um, any potential gaps in service and how we can fill those in. Thank you. Um, so back, back to city agencies, <laughs> sorry. So the city agency registration front, I mean, notice like Parks Department TLC has not reported one single form transmitted back to the BOE. Do, do, do we know why that is the case? I, I cannot speak specifically to those agencies, although I'm happy to inquire and follow up. That, that'll be great. Just, I mean, I'll just, I guess the best way to go forward is just to see about what are the best practices of agencies that has worked really well and what are the practice of agencies that has not worked as well. Um, so thank you. And then we also just noticed um, in 2018, there was actually a significant uptake in the number of voter registration forms that was returned in the second half of 2018. Is there any thoughts about why that was, that was the case? Yeah, we actually um, conferred internally about that question, and and frankly, we we actually think that the Trump presidency and the fact that we had federal midterm elections were the the primary reason for that increase. I don't know if the CFB has other thoughts, but that was the conclusion we reached. That could very well be the case. Obviously, that's not a you know, scientific conclusory statement, but a theory. No, thank you. That was just, again, back to trying to think about what are the best practices of some agencies that worked well and some that dimmed. So that's not in control. <laughs> <laughs> 
And what additional steps, um, you know, you guys did talk a lot about a promotion of uh, voter turnout, which is also an important part of this. So what are the additional steps do you think City Hall has in the, you know, to, to uh, promote this uh, voter turnout? Do you mean what else are we planning to do to improve turnout? Yes. Um, well, I, you know, that's, that's something that we're discussing as we speak. Obviously, the new administration has been in office just, just about two months. Um, we do know that they are very committed to this work and, and to continuing the work of both the CEC and Democracy NYC. Um, and, and of course, this, the campaign finance board, it goes without saying. Um, I think that the interagency collaboration is actually something that the new administration is is extremely interested in you know they they just did the initial phase of their um nyc speaks voters or engagement survey and i think some of that information will help guide other interagency work um but i think it's certainly a priority to continue to improve access for all New Yorkers and to, to do whatever we can to support the rollout of the new municipal voting program that will launch early next year. So I, I, I mean, I would just add here, I, I reiterate that you know, our main challenge here is turnout. Right? We have a lot of people in New York City who are registered who don't come out regularly to vote, um, especially in city elections. Um, you know, so, I mean, that is why, you know, we are going to continue our work that we, that we do in each election, uh, providing information uh, and engaging New Yorkers directly, um, you know, through all of our platforms, through the voter guide. Um, it's part of why we've recommended that, um, it, you know, if, if you are looking to kind of get back into Local Law 29 and, and improve um, the services delivered through the city agencies, is to give them a more direct role uh, in that proactive Kind of engagement and, and, and ensuring that not only are those opportunities available for New Yorkers to register, but also to get them um, that information they need in order to engage um, actively and meaningfully. Thank you. I definitely do agree there. I definitely want to explore ways about how we could get the more agencies more involved, as you said, not just in voter registration, but actually turning out the vote once that is done. So thank you. I think I, I am I'm good for now. I, I feel like other city council members here have been hearing have their hands up. Thank you, Chair. I'll now call on council members in the order they've used the Zoom raise hand function. Council members, if you'd like to ask a question and you have not yet raised your hand, please do so now. You'll have a total of five minutes to ask your question and receive an answer from the panelists. The Sergeant at Arms will keep a timer and we'll let you know when your time is up. Once I've called on you, please wait until the sergeant has announced that you may begin before asking your question. And as a reminder to our panelists, please stay unmuted uh, during the question and answer period if possible. I'd now like to welcome Councilmember Brewer. Starting time. Um, thank you very much, Madam Chair and um, panelists. I mean, my first question, as you know, when I was in the board president's office, I did not think that Democracy NYC or any of these other charter mandated November agency should exist. I'll be honest. So I don't understand why CFP can't do everything. So can you explain to me how you work together and how it's very confusing. I don't know what CFP does, voter assistance. I don't know what you do. I don't know what the civic engagement does. And I don't understand the state obviously has motor voter. But how do you all work together? Do you work with the state? Who's overseeing whether or not these agencies comply? I don't even know that. There's too many agencies involved. All right, that's my opinion. I don't know who wants to answer. CFP may be afraid to answer. So Laura, go ahead. Thank you, Councilmember Brewer. I know too much, everybody. I'm telling you right now. <laughs> you I was here you are voter voter with definitely I extremely well educated. Right. So go ahead. Um well, there was a lot. There was a lot there, so I'll do my best to answer. But if I don't get to everything, please feel free to remind me. Um, I, I, I really do take your point quite seriously, and and one thing that we have really tried to do, at least since I've been part of the Democracy NYC initiative, is ensure that we are adding value. 
um, and that we are helping with coordination rather than hindering it. Um, so I mentioned already that, you know, well, first of all, since, again, since the inception, we have worked extremely closely with the campaign finance board to ensure that we are not duplicating efforts. And that goes for, that goes for voter outreach, that goes for advocating for policy. Does it say somewhere what CFB does and what you do and what the state does? Because the state's involved too, voter voter. Um, I don't believe there's a specific statute that that speaks to all of that. Obviously, the CFB's work is governed by the New York City Charter. Um, Democracy NYC primarily is governed by the executive order that I mentioned that was signed late last year that merges it into the Civic Engagement Commission. To your point about you know making sure that there is more efficiency. Th that merger was was precisely for that reason to um, to basically acknowledge that the Civic Engagement Commission was already doing a significant amount of voter engagement and language assistance work, and that it made sense going forward to fold Democracy NYC into that work. Um, so CEC has our has an outreach team, as as I mentioned, it conducts the Pulse Site Language Assistance Program. It seemed like um, like the like the most efficient thing to merge Democracy NYC into it. But who oversees the agencies to see whether or not they comply with the law? As far as the, yeah, um, as far as the the compliance, and this is I I think frankly something that the committee might want to take a closer look at. My understanding, although the CFP should certainly chime in is that the office of op the mayor's office of operations is the agency that that it actually collects the required information from each of the covered agencies under local law 29 but it actually does not give them or anyone specific the specific mandate to require compliance um, and, you know, the CFB obviously is mandated to provide training, but, but also does not have that oversight function. I'm so, aware of that. I'm sort of answering the question, but I know the answer to it. But, <laughs> the, but the other question, well, how about motor voter? You have nothing to do with motor voter, but who oversees that? And do you coordinate with them at all on the state level? Well, we, we're in constant contact with the state board of elections, certainly. Um, and, you know, as I mentioned, you know, actually, the, well, I didn't mention this, but the turbo vote tool actually does directly communicate with the state online voter registration system through the DMV. So if someone has a state issued DMV ID, they can register online completely. Unfortunately, as of now, those are the only individuals in New York who can do it. But our understanding from the state is that sometime next year, knock on wood, both the state online voter registration system as well as the first phase of the automatic voter registration system will be rolled out. And we will certainly be working closely with them to ensure that those systems and any accompanying information is provided to all city agencies and other partners. I'm expired. So, if I have one more quick question, because we only got one shot at this. Go ahead, Eric, you want to say something? Because I yeah, I, I would love to add just just add a few things in response to your, your question, Council Member. So our, our mandates are actually pretty pretty well defined um, in the charter. I mean, we, of course, uh, administer the, the, the matching funds program. Um, we, we, we prepare we and well. print the voter guide. We, we have the oh. we, we run the debate program and, and we have a specific mandate to increase voter registration and voting among all New Yorkers eligible to vote, but specifically uh, among those voters who are underrepresented uh, among the voter population. And so consistent with that, you know, relevant to this discussion, um, we, we are mandated to support the implementation of Local Law 29 by, by you know, by providing guidance to, to agencies to help them kind of help them help New Yorkers register to vote. Um, you know, we've, we have over the course uh, of, of that law's existence, worked closely with the administration, um, whoever is in office at the time, because ultimately it is up to the mayor's office to oversee mayoral agencies and ensure that they are complying with the law. But you know, I would, 
I would just kind of want to reiterate and underscore the importance of, of kind of a consistent and constant um, coordination um, between, between us and, and the other agencies that are, that are involved in this work. I mean, it's just so important um, that New Yorkers can get their information about voting in, 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 in one voice with information that is reliable and trusted and, and clear. Um, and so we have, um, you know, just through the course of our work generally, worked very hard, um, you know, and, and kind of built, you know, really strengthened our relationships over the past couple of years as information about elections has been changing at such a rapid pace. Um, I've worked very hard to ensure that, um, you know, whether we're working with, um, with City Hall, our colleagues at Democracy NYC, our colleagues at the Board of Elections to ensure that the information that we're providing to New Yorkers during these times, you know, which have, again, we've been through a confusing couple of years, um, it, you know, that have really underscored the importance of ensuring that you know, the messaging that we're providing to New Yorkers is consistent. Right. I know what CFP does. It's the other agencies. I don't know what they do. Um, so I guess the issue quickly is we have to worry about compliance and who's in charge of it. We have to worry about, in terms of the turbo vote, getting credit for the agencies because it doesn't seem to be able to do that. Now, my other quick issue, I've been on, I don't know, 30,000 Zooms. I don't know, so many. I have never seen on anything with city agencies something about voting ever in my life. And I think I've been on 30,000 Zooms. So just so you know, we're not dealing with Zoom and agencies. And I, 30,000, never heard the word voting in my life. And the other issue is the voter registration uh, form is the most boring goddamn thing I've ever seen in my life. Can somebody redesign it so that it has something to do with current graphics font? I mean, I just threw out a whole bunch in my office. I couldn't stand them. I don't even know what the date was on them. They were so awful looking. So I need new voter registration forms. I need something that is interesting to the public. I need to be, next Zoom I'm on, I want to see how you vote, how you register, how you blah, blah, blah. And the other thing is, is up to the chair and me and the other elected officials, you have to be careful. The, the, the local groups are like during the census. Look at the census model. Groups are funded to go out and they did a great job. You know, 89 more members would have been great, but we did a great job. But you have to be careful because you don't want people to tell people how to vote. People do that. Bad, bad, bad. Not supposed to do that. So how do you make sure that the trusted groups get people out? And at the same time, they don't do illegal things and tell them how to vote. But that is the only way you're going to get people out to vote. Me telling, you telling, they don't care. It's got to be a trusted nonprofit or somebody. That's what you got to think of. And the different form, and then these two other issues I think we need to work on. I could go on and on. I don't, thank you. Thank you, Chair. I'm done. So. I don't want to speak. Thank you, Council Member. Um, I'd now like to welcome Council Member Ressler to ask questions. Starting time. Thank you so much. Let me first congratulate my friend, our, our Chairwoman Sandra Ong, on her first hearing. Uh, really happy for you and excited for all of us to be working with you on government ops. Uh, it's great to be uh, kind of working with you here. Um, and I want to thank uh, the folks in the CFE, Eric and, and the team uh, for all your great work um, in pulling off a couple pretty complex election cycles. Um, and I really want to commend Laura and the whole team from Democracy NYC for everything you've done to educate New Yorkers and engage New Yorkers um, in really challenging times. Uh, it's been uh, incredibly impressive. Uh, the question I had uh, related, I had a couple questions if it's time for me to so I'm at a bus rally, so I'm trying to, um, hopefully it's not too loud. Um, but the couple questions I had were first uh, related to agency enrollment um, of how city agencies were doing in terms of enrolling voters. Have, have we thought about putting public benchmarks or goals for city agencies for the numbers of voters that we're hoping that they might enroll? And then relatedly, are there city agencies that are not doing as much as we might hope they could considering how many New Yorkers they're engaging? And might you highlight some of the agencies where we might be able to partner with them to expand their voter registration efforts? Sorry, 
Thank you, Council Member Ressler, and welcome to your first government operations hearing. Um, I will, I'll start out, and I'm sure that my colleagues from the CFB will want to chime in. Um, first of all, in terms of the benchmarks question, I think that's that's a really good point and, and actually was something that we were starting to discuss internally back in 2019. Um, I, I will say, frankly, I do think this is one of the, the, the effects of the pandemic um, where it just sort of had to had to hit the pause button on on that particular topic um, because agencies were struggling so much just to provide the basic services to their clients. Um, but I think now, knock on wood, that we seem to be entering a new phase um, perhaps it is time to consider that. Um, and I, and I think that chair Ung's, you know, she pointed out a few agencies that seem to have lower numbers. I think TLC and parks were two of the ones that she suggested. Um, so I think taking a very close look at the most recent rounds of metrics, um, as she also suggested really digging into why certain agencies do so much better, um, you know, what is the nature of their interaction with their clients? Do, the, do their clients feel like they have more time when they are having that interaction? You know, I could in theory see why someone at HRA would take the time to fill out a voter registration form, whereas someone interacting with the parks department might be, you know, might have a different agenda, might be less inclined to do so. But, but I think, you know, it's great that, the, that this committee is really asking these questions. And I think we should roll up our sleeves in the next few months and, and get to the bottom of it. And then, and then really be ready when we do have this online voter registration system to hit the ground running and, and make, make that even more accessible to more New Yorkers. Great. Thank you, yeah. that's helpful. Oh, go ahead. No, I, I was just good. I was going to love Amanda to, to jump in and talk about I think some of the some of the things where we think actually um, agencies are doing a great job and, and, and some of the, some of what we think is working it's, it's, um, as as uh, uh, it's kind of a way forward. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, and I would start out from a big picture sense. Like the tricky thing here is making this work well is less about what you can legislate and more about how personnel carries it out. So we had had many meetings with Democracy NYC back in 2019, sort of about how we can make uh, the agencies that are that point of contact with voters more effective and how we can look at things like metrics and maybe set some benchmarks. Um, and I think there are a couple of things that are important to keep in mind as we look at this. One, every agency that is designated under Local Law 29 has a voter coordinator who is on staff. That person can be basically at any level of the agency. They can be a frontline worker, they could be the general counsel and everyone in between. But when we see agencies do a good job with this and collect more registrations, it tends to be when the staff member is really committed to making it happen within their agency. So one of the things we recommend as being important is also making sure there's commitment and buy-in from the commissioner level and that these staff who are engaging in these are getting recognized and rewarded for doing so, which doesn't consistently happen. Um, you know, I do want to say there are a number of agencies that even through the pandemic have worked with us very closely and have gone above and beyond. Um, for example, we work very closely with DYCD on their programming. Um, they have several paid programs for youth, and they incorporate us and our work into that programming, and we teach young people how to navigate the electoral process. And we've started doing similar work with ACS as well to reach out to youth in foster care, and we've been looking at more opportunities to incentivize youth to attend trainings um, about why voting is so important and helping them get registered to vote. Um, the Department of Education, you know, Laura had mentioned Civics Week for All. Um, they use a lot of our voter education materials as part of their curriculum. So there are agencies that have found creative ways to continue to incorporate this into their programming even throughout the pandemic. Um, but it really took a, a level of commitment from those agencies to look at their operations and what they were doing even when a lot of in-person interaction wasn't happening so they could continue to provide that education. Time expired.
Can I just respond to that briefly? I, look, I, I appreciate that, that, and I, you know, if there are opportunities for us to engage the rec center managers, rec center managers, and the parks department, and and the folks who oversee that division to actually get them engaged, to be talking to the young adults and uh, the hundreds of thousands of New Yorkers that rely every day on those services, and to better work with the TLC so that their service center in Western Queens, where they're providing support to members. Is better focusing on voter on enrollment, uh, voter education, voter enrollment. Excuse me. I think especially as we're, you know, have a new universe of legal permanent residents that are hopefully going to be eligible to vote in next year's election. Um, we have an enormous amount of work to do at the city agency level to engage those individuals. And HRA and others are going to have a vital role to play. Um, but we really need to make sure that each of our agencies is, is humming and take, you know, uh, maximizing voter engagement, voter registration opportunities uh, when they're serving um, free card holders, legal permanent residents, to make sure that they're participating in, in the, the uh, electoral process, you know, as they're hopefully going to be able to do in the next election. Next, um, Thank you very much. Thank you, Council Member. Um, Chair Ong, I don't see any other hands raised. Would you like to ask any follow-up questions at this time, or should we move on to public testimony? Sure, this one quick follow-up question. What, what do you think is the biggest obstacle to promoting a better turnout? I'm happy to field that question. Um, honestly, a lot of what we hear, we know that uh, engagement is highest in presidential election years. Um, that's because every, every time you turn on the news, you hear about what's happening in the presidential election. You almost can't escape it, right? And what we tend to hear about, especially we have a charter mandate to focus on underrepresented voters. So when we talk to those voters and when we've done research, um, what we hear about the most is a, an information gap. Uh, people have a lot of questions. They don't know why these are why these elections are important, what these offices are for, who is running. Um, so a lot of what we focus on our, in our work is closing that information gap. Um, but I would also add a caveat to that that we saw after the June 2021 election, you know, um, or after the June 2021 election, turnout was higher than it had been in the past, and then it came down lower in November. So I think there's also an aspect of having, you know, contests that voters feel like their vote matters in, um, of having real choice. And that's that's the other side of the coin we can look at. Because if voters aren't having a real choice between candidates, there's only so much we can do in terms of providing information to make them feel like their vote actually matters in the outcome. I, I agree with, with that. I just would add, again, the incredible importance of providing information in multiple languages to address the fact that there are so many limited English proficient New Yorkers. Um, and, and as Amanda said, you know, really make sure that we are working with obviously our city agencies and, and external partners to, to help underscore the importance of these local elections, um, particularly these local primaries. Um, and you know, there are some fairly arcane state election laws that people have to grapple with in that process, such as the fact that we have closed primaries and, and deadlines that are often well ahead of when many New Yorkers start actually thinking about our elections. Thank you. I, I'm good to follow the questions. Great, thank you, Chair. Uh, we'll now turn to public testimony. Please be advised that for this portion of the hearing, we'll be calling on individuals one by one to testify. Each panelist will be given three minutes to speak. Please begin once the sergeant has started the timer. Council members who have a question for a particular panelist should use the Zoom raise hand function, and I will call on you after the panelist has completed their testimony. For panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and the sergeant at arms will set the timer and give you the go ahead to begin. Please wait for the sergeant to announce that you may begin before delivering your testimony. I'd now like to welcome Ahmed Butt to testify, followed by Helen Helmuth and then Ben Weinberg. Ahmed Butt, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Starting I time. I wanna thank committee chair Ong and members of the committee on governmental operations for holding this hearing and giving the Asian American Federation the opportunity to provide testimony. 
I am Ahmed Butt, and the Civic Engagement Coordinator at the Asian American Federation. AF represents a collective voice of more than 70 member nonprofits serving 1.7 million Asian New Yorkers. Our city agencies are vital to maintaining the health of our city and its people, and access to agency services has been essential to the recovery of Asian American communities during the pandemic. Thanks to New York City's pro-voter law, these interactions between com our community members and city agencies have also been opportunities to create a more engaged electorate of voters who understand that their votes give them a say in how their city and its agencies serve them. Agency-based voter registration has been successful in registering thousands of voters, and we commend our city agencies for increasing voter registration totals and improving on their registration efforts. It is our shared goal that all New Yorkers become more civically engaged, and we are here today to provide recommendations on how agency-based voter registration efforts can be further improved to meet the needs of Asian New Yorkers. Language access has always has been a central part of the city's efforts to meet the needs of community members with limited English proficiency. And changes to voter education materials and registration forms have put New York City on the right track to making our agencies and voting more accessible. However, language barriers remain high among Asian New Yorkers. Overall, 46% of Asians have limited English proficiency in New York City, compared to a citywide rate of 23%. The impact of these barriers on voter registration cannot be solved by policy alone, it can only be overcome by ensuring that in language resources are adequately available and bilingual staff are accessible to LEP community members. To make voting more equitable, in addition to improving language accessibility at city agencies, it is vital that culturally competent CBOs who are trusted in their communities conduct outreach with educational resources that convey the importance of voting and its local impact. For many potential voters, registration is not the push that gets them to the polls. They have to see how voting is a part of a larger community engagement that centers them and the needs of their neighbors. By partnering with CBOs, including those belonging to our AAPI Power Coalition, who collectively made almost 2 million contacts with Asian voters last year, and who serve eight different ethnic communities in four boroughs, our city can improve the ways in which it serves LEP voters. Our recommendations will help city agencies to ensure that LEP community members are not excluded from the voter registration efforts due to a lack of adequate resources or training. These are ensuring adequate supply of translated voter registration forms in citywide languages, including links to voter registration forms translated into citywide languages on agency websites, ensuring an adequate supply of voter educational materials in all citywide languages, ensuring adequate staffing of bilingual employees at city agencies who are properly trained to register voters, and partnering with CPOs, including those belonging to our AAPI Power Coalition to conduct culturally competent voter outreach. I want to thank you for giving the Asian American Federation the opportunity to testify before you today. I look forward to working with all of you to create a more civically engaged New York City and hope our recommendations will help city agencies make further improvements to the voter registration efforts. Final slide. So thank you, Amit, for joining us today. I, I do actually do have a question. Um, you know, we talked a, a bit about the hearing today about how you know, it's important to, when dealing with voter registration, to deal with groups that the community trusts. I know Asian American Federation was, you know, out there in the forefront during the census. What, what do, does the Federation feel about that type of model in terms of increasing voter registration? So actually uh, that model working with like um, NYC census, uh, we actually base our civic engagement model off of that. And uh, our civic our engagement program, which we started uh, uh, at the end of, around with the, the November 2020 election, uh, it uh, really uh, centers grassroots uh, community outreach. And we found that canvassing during the census was really helpful for reaching uh, LEP community members. And uh, we thought the same thing last year when we were doing uh, outreach for the 2021 elections. Uh, and to expand on that, we. Uh, are providing grants to community-based organizations that uh, uh, provide direct services. So they're already trusted in their community and uh, have a lot of face time with them. So incorporating voter registration and pledging and education into that uh, has been a really helpful way to reach voters that, you know, uh, traditionally are considered hard to reach. Thank you. And, and because Federation is such an umbrella group that deals with so many social service agencies, have you heard any stories on the back end about how interactions with city agencies, especially a um, voter registration front, has, how has that, have you heard stories about did that work, did that not work? You know, just, I'm just trying to get right. more. Of, of course, I was, I was trying to um, uh, uh, field uh, questions on it as well with our uh, groups, but um, 
I was hoping we'd actually do a group testimony today so they can share. But um, yeah, I, I haven't heard, uh, as far as I know, like we've, uh, it's been said before that it's really a small portion of registration totals. So um, I haven't heard anything about uh, specific interactions with city agencies. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks. Thank you. I'd now like to welcome Helen Helmuth to testify, followed by Ben Weinberg. Helen Helmuth, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Starting time. Good morning, everyone. My name is Helen Helmuth, and I am a senior voting advocate at Disability Rights New York, or DRNY. I'm a white woman in my late 20s wearing uh, black glasses, a headband, and my hair is in a bun. By law, 26 city agencies are required to help register voters and increase public awareness about elections. And many of these agencies interact, frequently interact with people with disabilities. Based on reporting data, there appears to be some correlation between the number of staff trained at each agency and the number of completed applications delivered to the City Board of Elections. For example, in 2016, the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene trained 28 staff and returned 41 completed voter registration applications. In 2019, 26 staff were trained and returned 52 completed applications. But in 2021, based on the reporting data from um, the Health and Mental Hygiene, the office, zero staff were trained and zero completed voter registration forms were submitted. Um, the number of distributed applications dropped from over 1,700 in 2016 to only 226 in 2021, and that's an 87% decrease, which is substantial. Agency staff should receive training regularly at least once a year to remind staff of their voter registration duties and educate new staff of this requirement. Mandated annual trainings also create an opportunity for staff to learn about updated voter laws in New York City and state. For example, they knew um, laws about individuals who are on parole and also legal non-citizens voting in citywide elections beginning in January of 2023. It's important that the training agency staff receive include um, the voting rights of people with disabilities, tips on how to support people with disabilities, and referral information for agencies that regularly support voters with disabilities like DRNY. DRNY is particularly concerned about the rights of potential voters with disabilities who interact with the Department of Probation and the Department of Corrections, although I was encouraged to learn today about the voter registration initiatives um, by Democracy NYC and the Campaign Finance Board on Rikers Island. However, DRNY still encourages the Committee on Government Operations to consider ways they may be able to better support these communities. Under law, the Department of Probation has the additional duty to distribute voter registration forms and educational materials during their intake process. However, despite serving 1,900 individuals between July 2020 and June 2021, zero applications were distributed. Um, they also have the requirement to deliver absentee ballot application reporting requirement on that, so there's no way for us to know. Um, in order for these laws to be successful, we, we must analyze the effectiveness of agency participation, and we must con Inspired. consider ways to strengthen the laws in place for these laws to have their intended impact. And I'm happy to answer any questions you all may have. Thank you. I'd now like to welcome Ben Weinberg to provide testimony. Ben Weinberg, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Starting time. Thank you very much. Good morning, members of the Committee of Governmental Operations. My name is Ben Weinberg. I am the Director of Public Policy at Citizens Union. Citizens Union is a nonpartisan good government group dedicated to making democracy work for all New Yorkers. For over 125 years, we serve as a civic watchdog combating corruption and fighting for political reform in city and state government. We thank the committee for the opportunity to provide comments today and commend Chair Ong for dedicating the first oversight hearing to elections and voting issues. CU has been uh, long active on the issue of agency-based voter registration. In 2014, we published a review of the city's compliance with the pro-voter law, which revealed widespread agency failure to implement the law. 
Um, following those findings, the city amended the law to improve the program. And I would like to make a few short comments on this issue. First, the 2000 re 2014 reforms indeed improved the program. BOE data shows that the number of voter registration applications originating from city agencies more than tripled from 15,000 uh, um, applications in the five years before the reform to over 49,000 in the five years following the reform. The share of forms distributed to clients that were returned completed to the BOE also increased, although it is still very low as the chair mentioned before. Uh, second, not all agencies provide the same type of service for eligible for voters, as was mentioned here today, although it is encouraging to see that the agencies that submit the largest number of forms to the BOE serve New Yorkers who need it the most, like HRA, uh, the Department of Youth and Community Development, Department of Corrections, um, but others, as was mentioned here, the Parks Department among them do not submit any forms or just do not submit any data about the, uh, their activity. We recommend examining the procedures used by agencies that do have a high return rate, like the Department of Agencies, DORIS, CCRB, uh, and our written testimony include a list of uh, return rates per agency that could assist this discussion. Uh, third and related, there are significant discrepancies between the data reported by city agencies and the BOE. So for example, between 2015 and 2020, the BOE reported that it distributed a total of 1.2 million code nine voter registration forms to city agencies, but city agencies reported they distributed seven over 7 million forms. Some of that difference, difference is uh, bound to exist because the HRA uh, does not use the forms marked by the BOE, but that does not ex explain the, the, all of the discrepancies. Um, regarding automatic voter registration and online voter registration, I won't repeat uh, what the CFP has said before. We support their comments that they have made, but I do want to add that it's important to ensure the codes that are currently assigned to agency-based voter registration continue, continue to be assigned uh, to online voter registration. Um, and one more note, uh, Citizens Union does believe that it's important to uh, expand the pro-voter law to include the DOE, the Department of Education, and assign a unique code for registration forms originating from schools. We do not have a way to uh, track how many voter registration forms are distributed to students today. Um, and this is even more important as we consider the implementation of the um, pre-registration, right? 16 and 17 year olds that can today uh, register to vote. Um, that reform has kind of been uh, shown slow progress because of the pandemic, um, but we also have no way to track it because the uh, BOE does not publish any information about how many people pre-registered to vote. Uh, thank you again for the opportunity to speak today and um, I welcome any questions. No, thank you for joining us. I, I do not have any questions, but I, I do appreciate your comment about DOE. I personally was, re I, I registered to vote through actually um, school during my last year in high school. So I think um, that was actually a very good suggestion. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, at this time, I believe we've heard from all of our registered witnesses who are on the Zoom. So if your name has not been called and you wish to testify, uh, please raise your hand now using the Zoom raise hand function. Oh, I'm sorry. I see Councilmember Brewer has a question. Councilmember Brewer. Starting time. Thank you very much. I have a question for uh, Ben Weinberg, which is, um, how do you think, or if it is already doing well, then I withdraw my question. But the coordination, as you know, between the state and the city and even the city agencies, does it make sense to you and Susan and others that this is happening correctly? And if not, what could be improved? I know you were, um, I thought one of the suggestions that was made by CFP, which is that whoever is doing the voter activity in an agency is incredibly important that one person can make or break that agency. But I was just wondering, you know, what you think about the coordination. And then second, do you also have ideas about how we could do better as a city on getting people to vote? One thing to register is another thing to vote. Those are my two questions. Thank you, council member. So on the question of coordination between city agencies, um, I think that as far as I've seen, and I, we've been tracking the kind of semi-annual reports of uh, agencies, 
since Democracy NYC uh, began being part of this program, it seems like coordination has um, improved. But as they and the CFB have mentioned, there's no no one has the authority to uh, compel any of the agencies to do anything here. So um, this really all is based on the goodwill of, uh, of specific agencies and the coordinators in these agencies. Um, in terms of the coordination between the city and state, I think you also asked about that. Um, there, I'm not, I'm not uh, familiar enough to answer that question. Um, I will say that th that question will become even more relevant as automatic voter registration comes into effect because uh, AVR doesn't include only state agencies. It also includes NYCHA um, and, if I'm not mistaken, the HRA. So that means the state law will have to be um, um, uh, HRA will be part on under state law and under city law here. Um, and in terms of oh, increasing voter turnout more generally. So the um, eight point eight million uh, people question, I guess. Um, <laughs> you know, we're now developing um, um, or still developing our position about. Um, the importance of shifting election years, actually, in local elections, um, and the possibility of um, considering moving local elections to um, even number of years to consolidate them with um, states elections. Um, but I, I'm, you know, we're still kind of we're, we're analyzing the data around that. That's one big uh, option. The big gap in um, in the general election, as was mentioned here, the big gap in turnout in general election is uh, usually because it is a non-competitive election. Um, Citizens Union supports opening uh, the primary to have an open primary system, which would sorry, which would help um, the general election as well. Thank you. Thank you, uh, and I see no other hands raised, so I'll now turn it over to Chair Ong for closing remarks. Thank you, I, I wanna thank everybody for joining us today. Um, we are here today because civic engagement, voter registration, and obviously the million dollar question about voter turnout is you know, what you know, we want to do better. Uh, for this city. So I do um, thank you everybody for testifying and taking your time out of your busy morning to do this. I do look forward to working together. And hopefully, um, even though I know we can't answer all these questions or do everything we want, I hope we can slowly move toward um, doing what we want to do today, which is to get more people registered city agencies and to have a better voter turnout. So thank you for joining us today. Carol, you just need to gavel out, please.